Good evening and welcome to De Facto Review. We have here tonight Moggy Badra Bontoy and Terence, the freelance journalist in Mongolia, Moggy of Cover Mongolia, and myself, Grace Brown. We are live on Facebook at V Television. You can also find us on Twitter, hashtag De Facto, coming up on the program. Former Prime Minister Norav Alton Huyag makes a bid for the presidency despite political headwinds. Mongolia's central bank intervenes after the country's currency slides 10%. Going once, going twice. Find out the latest prices on Mongolia's state-owned enterprises. As the global COP22 summit begins, we look at the impact of climate change in Mongolia, where temperatures have climbed three times faster than the world average. And three miners trapped in Nilak are rescued, but what more is being done to ensure safety in some of the world's most dangerous mines? Joining us, we begin with Mongolia's presidential race. Just after the US presidential election has drawn to a close, Mongolia's former Prime Minister, Norov Altunhuyuk, has announced his bid to run for president next year. He made the announcement at a press conference earlier this week, where he also vowed to defend human rights and rule of law. Um, Moggy, his party, the Democratic Party, haven't officially nominated him yet. So what do you think the chances are for him? Well, the Democratic Party has a lot to figure out before even they think about uh, who they're going to choose to run for president. So next, just next week, they're going to have their national consultative meeting to decide on uh, their new party rules. And in December, they're supposed to hold their national congress to formally elect the new party chairman. So I think they have a lot going on before even they start thinking about who to choose for to run for election. But it's interesting that the, the former prime minister made this statement. I think uh, I don't think I've seen such a statement bef ever before because um, yeah, you can't just choose to run for uh, president. Your party has to formally uh, nominate you first. Mm. And only political parties who have seats in Mongolian uh, parliament can be able to choose a presidential candidate. So we only have three political parties in our uh, parliament right now, the MPP, DP, and the MPRP. Yeah. So, so for, for those of us who don't know what they are, that's the Mongolian People's Party, the Democratic Party, and the Mongolian People's Revolutionary Party. Right. And um, what kind of challenges do you think that he faces um, in getting this nomination? Obviously, when the party is sort of in an internal struggle to uh, figure out how which uh, which way forward the party party is going to be. Yeah, uh, given how few seats that they have after the of course, recent election. And this is obviously a good opportunity for the De Democratic Party to uh, may do some major uh, changes to how they are structured, how they are run, uh, to settle finally on a political ideology. It's on paper center right, but they never acted. Uh, center right in ever in their life, maybe only <laughs> the first time they got in parliament, which is in the 90s. So right. uh, they have a lot to figure out before even start thinking about, um, you know, as a united party, uh, elect, uh, nominate a presidential candidate. Do you think that Mr. Alton Huyag has a decent shot at this? Um, he's a prominent politician. He runs one of the biggest uh, factions within the Democratic Party, which is the Polar Star uh, mm. faction. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, he, he has a decent, uh, he probably has, they say he has the most uh, uh, members in the National Consultative uh, Committee as well. So, right. But obviously, if the party changes, they might change some, uh, the members of that uh, committee and, uh, you know, depending on who gets, who becomes the party chairman, might yeah. be, have a better chance of uh, choosing which, which person to run for um, pre presidential elections. I see. And Terry, who else do you think might be in the, the race, the race next yeah. year? So pretty much from day one, when the Mongolian People's Party took power, 
the fact that Mia Gumbel Ankbolt decided to take the parliament speaker instead of the prime minister meant to a lot of observers he's probably eyeing a president's job. Yeah. Now, he's a former uh, mayor of Olimbatar, and so is another favorite to run, mm. former mayor at Battle. Mm. So it could be a battle of the mayors this this summer. <laughs> exactly. So he's, his role might be complicated simply for the fact that a Democrat has already announced his run, mm. and there can only be one Democrat running, as Mogi m mentioned. The other fact is his son was related to the so-called Panama Papers leak, That's right. which had him linked to a therefore beforehand undisclosed foreign bank account. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the Mongolian People's Revolutionary Party has the opportunity to put forth a candidate, as they did in 2013. Uh, whether or not they do it remains to be seen. One person that could be chosen is Namber Ankhbayer, but that will probably be pretty difficult. He's still technically serving out a prison sentence he was paroled for. So while that's still occurring, legally he cannot run. I see. Well, it's certainly going to be a colorful race next year. Now turning to the latest turmoil in the Tugrig, Mongolia's currency, the uh, Tugrig plunged by as much as 10% on Friday. It's been very volatile against the US dollar in recent days until the central bank stepped in. Moggy, can you explain what the bank did? Well, the central bank has regular uh, foreign exchange auctions twice a week, mm. Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, but uh, the Mongol bank did not intervene in the forex market for three auctions in the running. And, but then they suddenly decided on Friday to have an irregular uh, FX auction mm -hmm. and sold $72.4 uh, at uh, 2450 and then also 73 million uh, Chinese yuan as well, mm. um, which they haven't intervened at all in the last three uh, auctions. So it's kind of um, interesting why they did that. They, they, just the day before and Thursday they did not intervene, but on Friday they decided to suddenly hold an auction. Yeah. It could be related to the cabinet meeting on Wednesday where the prime minister ordered the finance minister to come up with ways or study how to uh, stabilize the currency. So they could have, um, the cabinet might, might have pressured the central bank to intervene in the market as well. But the central bank has not been intervening at all, and they, they partly I think it, they, they haven't been is because the foreign exchange reserve has been dwindling mm. uh, for for a number of years now, and uh, uh, 1.2 billion dollars in yeah. reserves e equals to heard. only uh, three four months of imports. Yeah. So a central bank as a central bank needs to be have a stable amount of foreign exchange reserves when it's not clear when the next, uh, when the foreign investment will, might uh, return, it's not clear when, if there will be any kind of an economic bailout uh, with the IMF. So yeah. when these things Until are not clear, January. it's prudent for the central bank to be not intervening all the time. Mm. But uh, it did create a panic on Friday in the morning where- Big panic, um, yeah. Where, you, as you said, 10% drop. And uh, even in the black market, uh, Rates, Ed, were, Shaga, rates, yeah. rates were crazy. Yeah, and yeah. Just in the afternoon, the bank started selling foreign exchange because they just came out of an auction with uh, $72 million. Yes, that's right. Um, Terry, I think you know a little bit more about the, <coughs> the rates that the Turkwig has reached. I mean, earlier this year, it was actually the world's worst performing currency. The, so. Yeah, for the month of August. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what was it trading at roughly on Friday? So there was a lot of volatility in the Turkwig on yeah. Friday morning. Actually, at 9 a.m. that morning, the Bloomberg terminal stopped transmitting data about what was going on. And mm. even, even commercial banks weren't doing transactions. Where we did see the activity was a Naiman Shark black market for currency. This is basically just a street where there's a lot of shops for trading currencies and people walk around with giant wads of cash and they'll do exchanges right mm. there on the spot. So there was a big jump from 2,400 to the dollar to 2,700. Yeah. And then if you actually got to the point where if you wanted to buy dollars, it went up to 2,900. So there's a lot of volatility Huge. right there. Huge, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it, it dropped later in the day to Below 2,000 I saw, yeah. yeah. Wow. 
So the, it seems like the That's when Mongol probably, bank effort Right. So worked. probably, you know, the banks got 72 million and then people got the uh, dollars from the banks and went to Namisharga to yeah. get do some yeah. hedging on our, our margin trading on there. And a lot of um, commercial banks, um, you can't buy mm. or sell Man. US dollars, but at TDB on Friday, it was possible. The, the currency control was still in place at Han Bank, but there's some um, reports that TDB were doing it, so it's interesting. Oh. Also, the Bungo Bank did put out a statement. It was very vague, but they said that they were implementing some controls and that they were working very hard to make some kind of deal with partners, whether it be the IMF or nations such mm -hmm. as China or Japan. And they've got that meeting on the 29th yes. of November with the Chinese, so exactly. we'll see if the currency stabilizes. So then. We will probably see a downward spiral until some kind of crisis relief is offered to Mongolia. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully that isn't too far away. Um, moving on, earlier this week, Parliament approved the budget for 2017, and Prime Minister Jay Erdenbat said that state-owned enterprises, including the State Bank and the Stock Exchange and Orgel Springs Resort, are being privatized. Now, State Bank is going for $75 billion to Griggs, the stock exchange for 20 billion tug rigs and the Orgel Springs Resort for 7 billion. Also, the Mongolian telecommunications company at 7.6 billion tug rigs. So, um, how are they doing this? Is it going to be completely privatized or just partly privatized? Will the government still have a stake in all of these? Um, State Bank, Stock Exchange, the Telecom Mongolia, they would be. They will be partially privatized, but mm. the Oregon Springs Resort will be 100% privatized. Mm -hmm. But one thing we should remember is that every budget for the past, every budget that I've seen in the past few years had privatization lists. All these companies were listed in last year's budget, the year before that, the year before that. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to believe that the, that the state will actually go for privatization. And, to, and also to remember, it's not like they're trying to sell the entire state bank for 75 billion. They just want to receive 75 billion from a partial um, privatization. Mm. So it, it does not give you the full value of the state bank in the eyes of the government. Also, it, it's the budget. It's not like their investment base. It's not an investor presentation. And budget needs to be conservative. And the problem with our government and parliament was that we always overestimate our um, budget income mm. and uh, overestimate underestimate our budget expenses. Mm -hmm. Mostly so, because they're overestimating how much those commodities are. Of yes. course. And we have a fiscal stabil stability law where we need to have some level of budget deficit. We've been change amending that law for the past every year, but still we, did, we do have a budget deficit uh, ceiling where it has to be at a certain point. So putting these um, uh, privatization incomes is cushioning that or uh, uh, you know, making the budget deficit narrow so that in compliance with the law. Mm. It, but it does not mean that State Bank will go for exactly 75 or Stock Exchange will go for exactly 20. Obviously, there will be some kind of a bidding process and whoever you know, gives uh, the much most uh, investment will theoretically win. But then again, these companies were in the privatization list for the past five, six years at least that I've seen. So it's hard to believe that they will actually go for it this time mm. as well. And there's no specific time frame on this? No, it's, it's in the next year's budget, meaning that it's supposed yeah. to, this money is supposed to go into the budget next year. Yeah, yeah. Theoretically, but again, uh, it depends on the market. Uh, is, will the foreign investors or investors will be even interested in uh, taking up these uh, state-owned enterprises? These assets, yeah, it's interesting. Um, earlier this year, we had the privatization of Mongol Post, which was initially 100% owned by the government, but is now 34% in private hands. Yes. Yeah. Do you think that Mongol Post will be further privatized? Um, yes, potentially? According, according to the budget, they will be privatized even further, I think up to 49%. That was a uh, complaint uh, from the side of the 34%, you know, that they, they wanted have, more. That they wanted more in the control of private hands mm. because 34% does not give you the right to uh, 
monitor the, the company's activities or appoint any kind of people Directors. in management. So yeah. they were, in fact, they only 34% did not give them any kind of uh, shareholder rights at all. So they were complaining that they less was privatized. So this will be good news for the already 34% owners or whoever uh, potentially bids more for the, for the rest of them. Mm. Well, it's certainly interesting. Um, now, turning to an issue that affects Mongolia especially, the Global COP22 Climate Summit is getting underway in Marrakesh, Morocco. And Mongolia is actually one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change on Earth. Temperatures here have been rising by three times faster than the world average. That's according to the United Nations. So why is it? Why is this that Mongolia is so vulnerable? Um, I, I really don't know actually why Mongolian temperatures are rising faster. Um, maybe because our climate is very dry, it's very elevated. The, on average, Mongolia is the highest elevated country in the world, mm. more, more than even the you know, Everest countries like Nepal. So yeah. uh, that could be a, an issue also that um, overgrazing as, as uh, Mong fastened by Mongolia's desertification. Yes. I think we are the most desertifying country in the world. and. Uh, in danger of becoming a completely a, a desert in the future. Mm. Um, but that this, uh, this is a big problem for Mongolia because agriculture is the second biggest industry after mining. After mining and uh, most uh, and employs the most people in the yeah. country. So this will, this will affect the, not only just the nature environment, but actually the economy as well. Mm. Um, and, par and Mongolia livestock numbers has been at increasing getting, steadily, getting record every year. Fifty to seventy million livestock yeah. apparently Depends on this if it's, year. Depends yeah. on if it's counted in spring or autumn, because you know, obviously, some some, some die some, off. Yeah, some livestock are, are slaughtered, or some in the spring, more a lot of uh, livestock get get born. So, mm. fifty to seventy million—that's a lot, and uh, and um, in, this needs to be ha reduced uh, smartly. And uh, we need to have, I think best option to do is have, to have uh, livestock taxes. Mm. Herders are the only group uh, uh, laborers who, uh, who don't pay any kind of taxes at all. In fact, they get uh, subsidies for yes, it. Yes, and they uh, get rewarded, don't they, right. for having more animals. Yeah, They're considered they good rewarded, herders yeah. if they have a bigger herd. So. They get rewarded for how many goats they have, how many livestock they have, so it's, uh, it's not a healthy uh, economic policy to have. So mm. you need to put a tax on livestock. In, Decrease the number of livestock, increase the quality of the livestock, yeah. and also uh, some kind of put in a, some kind of a mechanism to control how much how the graze, how the, uh, the lands are being grazed as well. Mm. Yeah. So I mean, another factor is the I increase in extreme weather affecting Mongolia. That's why a lot of these herders are increasing their herds because it's an insurance policy in case they die. Um, you know, we're seeing more summer droughts, more harsh winters or tsuds. Apparently, uh, according to a German scientist, um, that this winter could be the coldest in 100 years for Mongolia. Oh, I mean, tell me that's not the case. Last winter was freezing. We had <laughs> temperatures around minus 50 in some parts of the countries and about a million animals perished. So. Well, I hope you got your warm coat, because according to this <laughs> yeah. researcher, Dominic Young, he was working with the Mongolian Research Center <clears throat> for Hydrology and Meteorology, and he was predicting that it would be the coldest in the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. I'll point out that superstitions say that this would be pretty bad. Mongolians believe that the year of the ape, which began last February, mm -hmm. uh, will mean that it's going to be a pretty difficult winter. But what's more important when it comes to livestock survival rates is whether or not Mongolia is prepared with its animal feed. So last year there was a drought which really exacerbated the situation. Fortunately, the government was able to respond and they did get enough feed to herders for emergency supply that it didn't get as bad as 2009, 2010 where 9.8 million animals mm. died. Yeah. So looking at this year, we have about 284,000 tons of hay, but that's still a big gap because Mongolia needs 1.2 million tons, according to the government. Yeah, so they've only got about a quarter of what's needed to get through. A little less than that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fifth, sixth or fifth. And I mean, when you, when you consider 
all the environmental challenges that herders are increasingly facing. Um, for example, desertification and uh, degrading land. Um, in, in particular, about 70% of the country's land is being degraded. Well, so by yeah, the UN Environmental Pro Agency has said that Mongolia, 70% of Mongolia's I'm so, yeah, 70% se of Mongolia's territory is being affected by desertification or land degradation. Mm, it's pretty so, serious, and about a quarter is turned to desert, right? Yes. Yeah. So it, there's a lot of Again, Mongolia is considered one of the most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Yeah. And it's heated up faster than anywhere else in the world, rising two degrees centigrade in the last 70 years. Which is, I mean, it's, it's actually above 2.1 degrees centigrade already, which yeah. is that critical global threshold that world leaders promised to try and avoid in Paris last year. So the, the situation here really is quite severe. Um, in addition to desertification, degradation, we also have melting glaciers. Um, the, in particular in the Altai mountain range, some of them have lost 30% of their ice in the last 70 years. So and the problem with that is a lot of that is the source of water and the herders exactly. are finding wa water more scarce. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, at, as a result of this, a lot of herders are leaving behind nomadic life and moving to the cities. Yep. And that's creating its own environmental challenges, right? right. You know, with well, when you look at the problem districts. with the air, it has a lot to do with people moving into the Gare districts because that's where it's most affordable. Yeah. And they're, it's, it, they can't afford to use the highest quality coal or even coal at all to keep their houses warm. They have no access to central heating and no water or um, electricity so it's it's difficult um, at the moment and they they have to use coal right the, the state energy regulator just last week uh, slashed half the electricity prices during the night for gear districts mm, mm. but just slashing the prices of the electricity will not help with the air pollution if if people don't buy electric heaters yeah and my, my wish is that you know our electric uh, suppliers, uh, these uh, chain stores, have like a camp sale campaign to slash their prices on electric heaters, and, and that way we uh, we could see more uh, gear district uh, people buy electric heaters instead of um, burning coal. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it, it, uh, sixty percent of the population lives in gear districts, and it's hard to ban coal altogether because you know they it's won't get reelected. Yeah, and it's, and it's the main source of fuel. Right. But we need to have a drastic measure to, to uh, fix this issue because, you know, for the past 20 or plus years, we have had these kind of um, uh, world-beating uh, uh, pollution in the winter. And I think the entire generation 80% of, of which right. comes from yeah. these household stoves yeah. that are being used in Gurs, We could have right? potentially 25 years worth of pollution. And I, I'm not sure how much the health ramification of this might, of this, we, we probably will only understand it in the next 10, 20 years where the entire population of the city has some kind of a health problem. Yeah. And that obviously will affect the health uh, healthcare system uh, which you know would probably in reduce the number of uh, people who, who work in in the in the labor force as well. So this needs to be uh, handled right now, or our entire country might be jeopardized because of this. Yeah. Well, the United Nations Children's Fund actually found a direct uh, correlation between air pollution in Mongolia and um, babies. Um, oh. Who? Yeah. Infant mortality. Infant yeah. mortality. Yeah. yeah. So it's um, it is a pretty important issue. Um, one of the things that could help to resolve it is increasing the price of coal as well as shifting right. to clean coal and renewables right. longer term like solar and wind. Uh, earlier this week, Prime Minister Erdenbat told coal companies, including Tav and Tolgoy, to come together mm -hmm. and basically agree on a higher coal price for export. Otherwise, right. he said that the government will step in and right. do so. Well, it was interesting. Well, there are three companies working on the, on the Tavantolko coal basin. 
Uh, two of them are state-owned. One is directly owned by the state, and one is directly owned by the province, South Gobi province. The other one is a private company listed in Hong Kong. So it's weird to see prime minister order these companies to uh, come up with uh, one window policy where there's a private company in the mix. Mm. But oh, in general, I think it was a good good gesture. I think it was long awaited. Uh, actually, one of the, the private company, MMC, has been uh, uh, advocating Mongolian for this. Mongolian mining very, company, yes. yeah. Just to expand on that, so it was actually more of a request than an mm. order, but he gave an ultimatum. He said, you guys have to sort this out for yourselves or I'll do it for you. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, to go back to my point, the MMC has been wanting this one window policy for a very long time. They've been asking uh, the state-owned companies to uh, use their, their washing plant to wash their coal and sell it at a higher price. So the, the, this could, um, I'm not sure if, it's, uh, if, it, if it'll work because there's still some uh, political, in, political uh, infighting surrounding the state-owned uh, coal companies. Mm. Well, speaking of coal, earlier this week, three miners were rescued in Nilak, just outside of Ulaanbaatar. Um, but, you know, this is hundreds of miners continue to dig for coal in this area. And uh, it's, it's a really risky business. I was out there um, earlier, uh, actually this time one year ago, mm. and I saw how they work. It's pretty shocking. A lot of them yeah. have no safety right. equipment, right? Yeah, it's pretty bare bones. I visited a couple yeah. mine mining sites throughout Mongolia. The Nalik one is dangerous because there's so it's such a large complex. Mm. Some people might have seen a report that called it one of the most dangerous mines in the world. Yes. I don't know if that's exactly true. There's they're all pretty difficult to work and they're not great as far as safety goes. But well, apparently they have more deaths per capita than in China. Yeah, I think that's per because ton of, of coal. Yeah. yeah. And I yeah. think that just be, speaks to the size of that that mining complex over there. Uh, there has been some push to formalize and professionalize the ninja miners in Mongolia, mm. but in practice I would say they're still lagging behind of where they they say they are. They're called ninja miners because they lack um, often proper tools some of them even without well, helmets, right? So it actually refers to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, mm. which was a popular, it, it broadcast in Mongolia in the 90s, and people did recognize them. And when they have these panhandlers and they throw them on their back, they look like turtle shells. Yeah, <laughs> it's, um, well, I mean, hopefully more will be done to improve safety there, because uh, in June, five people were rescued, but um, so many more working there. Hundreds to, to, to add to the Nalak thing, um, Nalak coal is, is quality is much more much better than Baganor uh, mm, mine coal. That's interesting. So that's it why sells for higher. And it supplies so, sixty percent of UB's right. coal in winter, right? That means all these ninja miners are supplying sixty percent of um, UB Gear District's um, coal needs. And you know, Nalak was a big coal mine, state-owned coal mine before. I, I was actually born in Nalak. My really? Grand, my grandfather you know, used to work at the state-owned coal mine. And the fact that they're supplying 60% of the city means that there's still um, a sizable amount of coal resources mm. in, out there. And while, while they're supplying 60%, there's, there's a ready market. Uh, why can't the state or a private company, private company enter and take a license on it and do geological exploration and have all those ninja miners have a state of, uh, work for, th for the company and have a stable income instead of jeopardizing their lives? Yeah, well, that would be a really good idea. Hopefully that's something that they'll think about. And that brings this edition of De Facto Review to an end. Thank you very much for joining us, and we hope you can tune in again next week. Until then, please follow us on Facebook. V Television is the page. And we're also on Twitter, hashtag De Facto. Thank you again. Good night. Good night, Good night. Good night.